Welcome back to Supreme Myths. I am really glad today to welcome an old friend of mine. We have done so many things together over the years. Professor Ilya Salman of the um, uh, Scalia School of Law. Ilya has his undergraduate degree from Amherst, a master's from Harvard, a JD from Yale. He is the author of numerous books, um, numerous articles, far too many to count. Uh, his most recent book, Free to Move, Foot Voting, um, Migration and Political Freedom, is just there uh, for you watch those of you watching on YouTube Ilya is, is holding it up if you're not watching it it's get it it's a really really good book Ilya welcome to Supreme Myths thank you so much for having me yeah, it's I'm an really, honor I, I always like talking to you because um, we have done enough together where we know we agree on some stuff we disagree on a lot but we always walk away smiling I think and that's that's a nice thing um, so let's start with your book uh, free to move can you I know it's hard to do this and a little bit unfair, but what's the essential thesis of the book? Sure. That we can greatly expand human freedom, political choice, and human welfare by expanding people's opportunities to vote with their feet, both within countries like in a federal system, for example, but also through international migration. Indeed, there's few, if any, other changes in their policies that advanced liberal democracies can make that would help more people to a greater extent than this one. That's a great, succinct encapsulation of a very complicated uh, book and thesis. Um, when you say free countries, I, I was curious. So this doesn't help people in Russia and China, right? I mean, because they're not free to move. No. So it, it would help them in that, particularly in the case of Russia, their government, we still, for the most part, is not preventing people from leaving. That's also true for China. So the international migration part of this can help them. Uh, I think breaking down barriers to internal migration in Russia and China could also help. In Russia, uh, there's still residency permit systems, which make it hard to move to Moscow and St. Petersburg. There's similar issues in China. Uh, so uh, this will not by itself end the oppressive nature of those governments, but letting their people uh, be freer to move elsewhere can help and uh, more internal freedom of movement can help people in those countries as well. So this is just going to betray my incredible ignorance of China. And I, I just I just am. I'm ignorant about China. I, I, anyone in China can just get up if they can get if, if, if we'll take them or England will take them or France will take they can just get up and leave. China has an it's, open door. It, it, it's, it's, it's more restrictive than that. Okay. Nonetheless, uh, since the Deng Xiaoping era, uh, many Chinese and probably most, they can emigrate from the country if they're, as far as their government is concerned, uh, the bigger barrier to them is whether uh, liberal democracies will let them in. Sure. Uh, that wasn't true in the Mao era, certainly when you know, uh, emigration was largely forbidden. Uh, but today, with both Russia and China, while there are some restrictions on leaving, at least for the moment, uh, people can exit. Um, the constraint on uh, liberty for them is that many uh, democracies will not let them enter. OK, I've already learned something new and we're going to have two minutes. So I've learned something new. That's <laughs> that's nice. Um, when you say foot voting, I, I assume this is a and not an or, right? I mean, the world would be a better place, or maybe not, but I'm, I know you, you've done a lot of work on ignorance and, and voting and all that, and it's great work, but I, I assume you're talking about this in addition to, obviously, voting in a democracy, free elections, and all that. To some extent, it's an addition to, but to some extent, it's also a substitute. Okay. Uh, in that I don't think we can completely, we can or should completely eliminate ballot box voting, but in some areas we can have incrementally more issues be subject to foot voting and fewer by ballot box voting. For example, uh, there are some laws enacted by foot voting even in democracies, uh, which constrain enacted by ballot box voting even in democracies, which constrain people's ability to vote with their feet. If we limit government's power in those areas uh, and, it's, and instead uh, expand mobility, uh, then at the margin, we're limiting ballot box voting and expanding foot voting. And that's a good thing because foot voting has two major advantages over ballot box voting. Uh, one is that when you vote with your feet, there's a high chance that your decision will actually make a difference in terms of what government policies you have to live under. Like when I decide what state to live in, for example, uh, or what country to live in, that's why it could make a big difference. By contrast, when I vote at the ballot box, the chance that my vote will make a difference, the outcome is usually one chance in many millions or <laughs> at least one or at best one in many thousands. Uh, the second and closely related issue is that 
when you vote at the ballot box precisely because there's so little chance that your vote will make a difference. Uh, it is You have a strong incentive to be what economists call rationally ignorant, to spend very little time and effort learning about the issues involved. And indeed, survey data show most voters often don't know even very basic things. Uh, when you vote with your feet, by contrast, you have much stronger incentive to become informed. If you're like most people, you probably spent more time and effort seeking out information the last time you decided what television set to buy than the last time you decided who to vote for for president or governor or any other office. That's not because the TV decides more important issues uh, or that it's more complicated. It's that you know that the TV set uh, that you get uh, will actually be the one that shows up in your living room. Uh, on the other hand, if you turn it on and you see the president or some other government official, uh, the chance that you can affect who that is or what policies they will follow uh, is infinitesimally small. So you probably spend less time and effort on that decision. I think as time goes on, you might need a different uh, object to buy than TV sets. My, my teenagers don't even think about TV. They just think about yeah. iPads and phones. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I sometimes use the, the iPhone as an example. Yeah. Uh, many people spend a lot of time figuring out what smartphone to get. Right. Uh, but then when they flip on the smartphone and they see the president uh, or some other government official, uh, you know, the same point applies. So I think uh, I'm not saying anything profound here. One obvious critique is too strong a word. One obvious um, response to all this is this is all very good if you have the money to leave. Yeah. But but, um, there's a, there's a, the, but there are a lot, billions of people who don't have the money to leave. So the problem of moving costs is a real thing. Uh, but I would say a couple points on it. Uh, one is far from being disproportionately beneficial to the wealthy, foot voting historically is disproportionately beneficial to the poor and disadvantaged because they have the most to gain from moving to a jurisdiction where government policy is better offers more opportunities and is less likely to oppress them. Second, uh, at least direct moving costs, like the cost of physically moving from place to place, shipping your stuff and so on, they're much lower today than ever before in human history. Uh, and indeed, uh, modern transportation makes this much easier to do. And third, we can take steps to reduce moving costs. For example, we can decentralize power to low, lower levels of government and also in some cases the private sector. Um, moving from one town to another is much less costly in terms of moving costs than moving across the country or to a different state. Uh, and uh, when you vote with your feet in the private sector, often you can do so without physically moving at all. Uh, but for the many people uh, trapped in places where they're condemned to poverty and oppression, even relatively high moving costs are more than worth it uh, because of the enormous gains that they could have. Uh, and of course, modern credit markets and finance markets, if we let them function, they would enable people to borrow against what would be their likely higher future income. Such arrangements existed already in the 18th and 19th centuries when moving costs were much higher and the economy was much more backward and primitive. Today, those kind of arrangements could function much better and for more people, if only we would let them. So I want to make two observations to that, okay? Um, and I, I think that's, a, that's a, those, are, those are reasonably persuasive responses. Um, internationally, I don't know. I, I don't know if this is an idea that could really catch on in desperately poor countries where they're worried about eating their next lunch, much, you say shipping costs. Sh shipping costs is the last thing on the minds of people who need to find a way to eat lunch. Um, but, but, but having said that, on, that's one hand. On the other hand, let's bring this to America for a minute. Never has the ability to change your political fortunes, I'm taking poverty out of it now, been cheaper or more easy to change through your theory than today, because it used to be you'd have to go from Georgia, South Carolina, Mississippi, Alabama, up north, as you talk about in your book, like African Americans did, you know, several times in our country's history. Today, take my state, if you really want to live in a conservative place, you, all you have to do is go 25 miles outside of Atlanta. And if you want to live in a really liberal place, all you have to do is be in Atlanta. And moving 20 miles, 50, and you can really get a whole different political calculus. The mayor who runs my city, is a very different mayor than the mayor who runs other cities in Georgia. And our political structure in Atlanta is very different than the political structure in South Georgia. 
And if people don't like it here, they can move there. You don't even have to, you don't even have to change states in many places. Some states you do. But even New York, Buffalo is what? seven hours by car from New York City and an entirely different world than New York City, right? So, so, so applied domestically, I understand what you're saying. Although, tell me again how a really poor family in rural Mississippi gets out of that, without government aid, how do they get out of that poverty to go to a place that is not rural Mississippi? If they want, I'm not condemning rural Mississippi, I'm just saying if you want to leave there, or even a desperately poor family in the South Bronx, how do they have the means to move someplace different? Yeah. So I think there's two or three questions yeah. bound up in that yeah. thoughtful comment. Let me try to take them each in turn. Sure. One is the question about people from rural Mississippi or other yeah. desperately poor places who want to move elsewhere. How do they have the means? I would first note that in the 18th and 19th century, America was populated primarily by the movement of people from much further away who were much poorer than True. even the poorest Mississippians. <laughs> and the reason for that is that at least until the late 19th century and things like the Chinese Exclusion Act, there were few barriers to entry. And also there were few barriers to building new housing in response to demand. So uh, if in places like California, New York and elsewhere, uh, we uh, abolished or limited zoning restrictions, which make it hard to build new housing in response to demand. Those people from rural Mississippi could move to th those places or others where there are better job opportunities, better educational opportunities, better government services of various kinds, uh, and uh, cheaper housing can be built in response to demand to the extent that they might need some money initially for rent or for other purposes. You can borrow against your future income, which again was something that immigrants from from Europe did uh, even back in the 18th and 19th centuries when credit markets were much more primitive. Uh, and uh, you could do this today also if you break down the barriers of zoning restrictions, which make it hard to build new housing. And in some states also licensing restrictions, which make it hard for people to work in their chosen field. I know as lawyers, we may think of white to think as primarily something that elite professions have or seemingly elite ones like lawyers and doctors, but currently like something like 30% of all American workers need licenses to do their jobs. And often it's set up in a state by state way in a highly protectionist fashion so that you may need to study for months or years before you can do the job in a new state. So that's an additional barrier which disproportionately affects the poor and disadvantaged, including in professions like plumbing, or in some cases, even being a florist or an interior decorator. So if we reduce those barriers, the people in rural Mississippi can do more. On the international side, many of the same points apply. Uh, historically, it is precisely the poor and the starving or people on the brink of starvation and the like who have been most likely to try to move. Uh, and if we reduced legal and other similar barriers to migration, more of them would. Uh, and even those who remain behind, as I discuss in my book, they can benefit from remittances that their relatives who do move can send back. In a country like El Salvador, those account for some 25% of GDP. So I don't claim this can save every person in the world <laughs> no. who is poor or oppressed, but it can save many, many millions of them. Uh, and it can do so faster uh, and cheaper uh, than almost anything else that we can imagine as a policy change made by liberal democracies. And of course, it would benefit our economy and the overall world economy as well, because by moving to freer and wealthier societies, these people would almost instantly become much more productive. Some of the benefits of that extra productivity obviously would go to them, but many would go to the rest of us. Uh, and those people, uh, migrants of various kinds, are also disproportionately likely to be entrepreneurs or scientific innovators, and that has huge benefits as well. Uh, to give just one recent example, the inventors of the first two successful COVID-19 vaccines were uh, all of them, or almost most of them were either themselves immigrants from poor nations or children thereof. It is very likely that if they had stayed in their countries of origin, in one case, Palestine, in another case, Turkey and the like, very unlikely they could have made those same contributions or been anywhere near as productive as they were. Uh, and the benefit of what they did saved millions of lives around the world to, save, to say nothing of the economic benefits. But those were upper class people. I mean, obviously. no, they weren't. They were poor people when they left. Oh, okay. uh, in, in one case, uh, in the case of Pfizer, 
uh, the person was the child of Turkish guest workers. Ah. Uh, Turkish guest workers in, in, in Germany uh, are people who do almost entirely menial jobs. In, the, in another case, uh, I think in Moderna, it was an individual who when they left uh, the West Bank, I think it was like 15 or 16. So uh, they certainly weren't uh, wealthy yeah. yet. Uh, so it was not a case of somebody who was already a successful scientist or the like in the country that they came from. It's very much different from that. Not an Einstein type thing. That's fascinating, Ilya. I didn't know that. I'm, that's really interesting. I think a lot of people are going to be surprised when they hear that who haven't heard you, heard you talk before. Okay. I hereby dub thee the king of immigration for the United States. You have complete <laughs> power. You have complete control. Tell me your rules. My rules would be to abolish virtually all existing immigration law and simply make a presumption in favor of international migration, similarly to the presumption in favor of domestic freedom of movement that we currently have. Uh, and you know there can still be restrictions if we have a, you know evidence that a particular individual or group are planning crimes or acts of terrorism or the like. Uh, in situations, and I think they will be rare, uh, where you can justify restrictions on internal freedom of movement based on something like spreading dangerous disease or the like. Uh, you can justify similar ones internationally. In most cases, even those restrictions would not be categorical bars, but things like keyhole solutions, uh, as scholars label them, that is mechanisms of reducing risk uh, by means that don't uh, bar migration entirely. So the bottom line would be a presumption in favor of freedom of movement that you can live and work where you want. Uh, and the government could overcome that presumption uh, by meeting a high burden of proof of showing A, there's some grave danger, and B, there's not another less restrictive means uh, of overcoming it. And this is going to betray my ignorance again, so I'm sorry. And I, I'm uncomfortable with this because I've done a lot of these podcasts now, and I'm usually I know I usually know a lot of what I'm talking about. Here I do not, but you do, and that's and that's nice. The European Union works that way, right? I mean, am I for it, it works that way for uh, citizens of the European that's what I mean. Union? But that's France, um, Spain, Germany. I mean, that's a lot of countries, right? Yeah, and uh, they have some 600 million people, and it's worth noting that the gap in income between the poorest members of the European Union, like Bulgaria and some others. And the wealthiest, like uh, uh, you know, some of the Western nations, it's comparable to that between the United States and Mexico, or even greater. Uh, right. So, if the European Union has been able to do this, that's at least some strong evidence that uh, you know that uh, we could do it, uh, and you know, we would have net positive effects, as has been the case with the European Union. And, uh, the famous and, Polish plumbers that have moved to France have benefited the French economy, and also they themselves obviously are making higher incomes than uh, they could back in Poland. Conservatives, I'm going to be very careful here, conservatives, not libertarians, and we'll get back to that topic in a second, but conservatives in England, Conservatives in America, I don't know enough about France and other, well, and conservatives in France, I don't know about the rest of it, um, would all disagree with you mightily that they're, con I'm, not saying, I'm just saying what they would say. Many conservatives in the United States, France, and England would say uh, relaxed immigration is a terrible policy. It has done, an, even limited, limited immigration that some of those countries have, ha has done terrible things. Um, and, and what you're asking for here, for example, again, I'm not saying this. If you open up our southern border, we will have millions of people coming through it, many of them with criminal records we cannot check, many of them um, uh, leaving conditions that are really awful to come to better conditions, but no, won't necessarily be productive members of our country. I am not saying any of those things, but I, I have heard those things out of the mouths of conservatives you know, for, for two decades. How do you respond to that? Yeah. So you've raised several different points here. Uh, most of them have to do with possible negative side effects of migration uh, that it might exacerbate or create certain problems, increase crime, yeah. overburden the welfare state, uh, and so forth. Uh, I have a whole chapter of my book, chapter six, devoted to those kinds of issues, and I have a framework for addressing them. Uh, the, uh, it, it requires us to ask three questions. First, uh, is this a real problem or how big is it? And in many cases, it will turn out that it's not. For example, immigrants to the United States, including even undocumented immigrants from Central America and Mexico, actually have much lower crime rates than data border. And Americans. by the way, sorry to interrupt, but I just want to make the audience clear. I agree with that 100%. I mean, I, I'm on that side of this question. So sure. I want to be clear about that. Go ahead. 
so I'm not necessarily answering you, but yeah. answering yeah. those people who, yeah. who do believe these objections. Yeah. Uh, so the first question I want to ask again is, yeah. is this a real problem? Right. Uh, and in many cases, the answer will turn out to be either it's not a real problem or at least it's greatly overblown. The issue of crime is a good example of this. Immigrants, including undocumented immigrants from Latin America, actually have much lower crime rates than native born Americans. Uh, and this is also true, by the way, for welfare burdens as well. In both Europe and the US, if you compare jurisdictions with a lot of immigrants to those with fewer, uh, welfare spending per capita is not higher in the ones which have more immigrants. It may even be lower depending on which studies you look at. Uh, they disagree between those which say it's about the same and those which say that uh, it's uh, actually lower. Uh, but let's say there really is a problem, and I admit in some cases there could be. The second question to ask is, is there a keyhole solution? Uh, that is a mechanism of addressing the problem by means less draconian than keeping people out. Uh, and there's a long list of these for many problems. For welfare, the obvious one is to limit immigrants' eligibility for welfare, which, by the way, we already do under the Welfare Reform Act of 1996, but you could limit it further. Uh, similarly, if you worry that immigrants will be bad voters, that they'll vote for terrible candidates, you can, again, just do more of what we already do. They already cannot become citizens for at least five years, and even then they have to pass a civics test that data shows a majority of native-born Americans would fail uh, if they had to take it without. Uh, by the way, I, I'm an immigrant. I'm an immigrant, and I took the, and I took that test as a law clerk in 1983. Uh, obviously, I passed it. I, most of my friends wouldn't, you know, most of my native-born friends might not have passed it. <laughs> so, so I didn't know that about you. I'm sure you did very well on the test, but uh, it is the case that when you when you sort of do a survey and you give that test to native-born Americans who haven't studied up for it, uh, the, the majority will fail yes. it. Um, if they studied, they, they, you know, they probably could pass yeah. most of them. Uh, so you could potentially make the test harder. Yeah. You could make the waiting period longer, as it actually has been longer at some points in American history, okay. uh, and so on. But let's say uh, there is a real problem, and for some reason, uh, there is not a, a keyhole solution that is likely to work. Then you still have to ask my third question, which is, uh, can we use some of the vast new wealth created by migration uh, to address the problem that uh, concerns you? Uh, if you had free migration throughout the world, economists estimate that world GDP would double. That is, would be twice as productive as we are now because so many people would be able to be in places uh, where they could be more productive as opposed to trapped under poverty and oppression. And there is many ways that if we wanted to, uh, we could tap some of the extra wealth to address potential negative side effects. Let's say you believe, contrary to most evidence, but let's say you believe that uh, there's a large class of native born workers who will suffer from wage competition if there's more immigration and you think that's an injustice, we could tap some of that wealth and use it for subsidies uh, to those native born workers, wage subsidies, we could use the earned income tax credit system for that purpose if we wanted to. Similarly, if you think immigrants are increasing crime, uh, you could use some of that money to put more police officers on the streets. Data shows uh, that studies by many scholars show that having more police on the streets reduces violent and property crime by immigrants and natives alike. Uh, I do hasten to add that ideally you would wanna also address issues with police abuses, which frankly we should address anyway. But uh, as my colleague, George Mason, Alex Tabarik has written in a series of works on this, it's possible to both have more police on the streets, but also to have somewhat tighter constraints uh, on their behavior by doing things like getting rid of qualified immunity and also by changing their incentives in various ways. And okay. there's a lot of other tapping the wealth type of ideas uh, that can be used to address other kinds of problems potentially caused by migration. Finally, uh, I would note that almost all of these objections, if you take them seriously, they would apply not just to international migration, but also to domestic migration of the kind that uh, conservatives typically welcome. For instance, they're often happy to say a lot of people are moving to Texas. That proves how great Texas's policies are, and they're to some extent right about that. But uh, if you worry that uh, international migrants will cause various problems. You can tell a similar story about Californians and others moving to Texas. They might vote for bad government policies in Texas. If they move from poor states, they might overburden Texas's welfare system. Some states have higher crime rates than Texas. Those people might increase Texas crime. 
uh, and you know, I can go down the list of typical sure. rationales for immigration restrictions. Almost every one of them has a domestic analog. Uh, and if you say that's not enough to justify barring Californians moving to Texas, or in my state of Virginia, we have West Virginia right next door, which is much poorer than we are and has a much higher crime rate. If this doesn't justify barring West Virginians from the great Commonwealth of Virginia, <laughs> it equally doesn't justify Mexi barring Mexicans from moving to Texas or California. Okay. I have an observation and then a final question about your book, and then we'll move on to other things. I, I really, um, this is an original, wonderful book, and people should get it. Um, whether, they, whether they agree or not, you know. Um, I do think on your last point, there is a difference between internal travel and external travel in terms of some constitutional issues that are, I don't want to get into it. I'm just saying, I think we could talk another hour about that and, and you'd have good arguments. I have some good arguments. Um, I'm not sure it's the same, but here's the question I really want to ask. Last question about your book. It's a personal question and I would like you to take just like a one second pause before you answer it. So you know, you know me well enough to know I'm a legal realist pretty much all the way down. Um, and I sometimes, not always, apply that to scholarship. I've certainly turned it on myself as a self-reflective thing. But I think, I think a true legal realist believes that academics uh, will also be affected by their life experiences, their val of course, their values, and all of that stuff. Um, and, and sometimes we can reject it from our own experience. But, but a lot of times it's, it's below the surface. Your parents came here from Russia, I believe, in the 1970s. I did myself. You came from Russia in the 1970s. Even better. Okay. Um, I, by the way, I'm an immigrant. I came from Canada when I was four. Not the same, <laughs> but still. Um, um, Escaping the great oppression of, uh, of Canada. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so how much of your own personal family experience is a motivator of this project? It's a good question that I cannot give a definitive answer to because we can't never know. We can never know for sure what I would be like if I were otherwise sure. the same person, but I had not been an immigrant. Sure. But I would say, and I've written a piece about this on the Voa Conspiracy blog, the real precursor to this project was not so much my experience of me being an immigrant as my experience of being a federalism scholar. In writing about federalism early in my career, I wrote a lot about voting with our feet. Uh, which in turn arose in part from my interest in voter ignorance and the point I made earlier in this discussion where uh, ignorance seemed to be less of a problem for foot voting. But then around 2007 and 8, I started reading some of the literature on international migration uh, and some things occurred to me which in retrospect should have been obvious earlier, uh, which is first, uh, international migration is also a form of foot voting. Uh, and even though the scholars who study international migration tend to be a completely separate group from those who study internal foot voting, in reality, the two things are similar. And then second, if there are benefits to voting with your feet within a federal system in one country, the benefits internationally are even larger because the differences between jurisdictions are so much greater in many cases. Think about whatever you believe is the best governed American state versus whatever you think is the worst governed, there may be a big difference between the two, but it's very small compared to the difference between the US and Cuba, or the US and Zimbabwe, or the US and Russia, and so on. Uh, so once I realized those two things, I also said, you know, I should extend this idea to international migration. I began to do that in a piece that I wrote in 2008. Uh, and I also felt that there was an opportunity here in that there are few, if any, people who are writing about uh, both internal foot voting and international migration in a common framework. So uh, life experience does matter here, but the more immediate precursor was not so much me being an immigrant as me being a federalism scholar and also a scholar of political ignorance. So that's a great answer. And I was not suggesting any of us know what motivates, you know, uh, all of our stuff. We, I, I just, we don't fully know. That's true. I just think your life story is interesting. And I think that's, you know, part of it. All right. Um, I, I need to let the audience into a little bit of the internal workings of this podcast to ask my <laughs> next question. Um, so what I do, I've done this, I think I've, this year number 55 or six or something. I don't know. It'll be on the thing. But um, for all my podcasts, I always send my guests uh, a very rough roadmap you know, of, of what they want to talk about, if they have a new book or a new article, whatever it is. Um, and a bunch of issues we may get to or we may not. And I say edit, delete, add, whatever, and we, work, you know, we, and we come and we talk. Um, and, and you work um, uh, 
I'm trying to think of the right word here. Uh, you, you have, an, I really respect your integrity. You know that. I always have respected your integrity. Um, and you told me, and I asked you and gave you every chance to say no, that you were willing to discuss something I've been writing about a lot recently, which is the name of your law school. <laughs> so um, I need about three or four minutes to give you my argument, and then I want you to respond to it. And I'm only doing this because you said I could, because I would never put anyone in the position of this without prior authorization, which you generously gave me. So um, uh, people who know me know that I am very upset that you uh, teach at the Antonin Scalia School of Law. Is that the, but the technical law name is Antonin Scalia Law School. That's your name. Um, and the reason I'm upset about this is because I have documented in a series of pieces, um, not that I disagree with originalism or I disagree with Scalia's views on this or that, but because the man himself, in my opinion, in modern times, Supreme Court justices need to be, um, you know, uh, evaluated based on the times they live in. Back in the 1950s, they were all racist and sexist by today's standards, and it wouldn't be fair to put our standards back in the 1950s. But Scalia is a modern judge, justice. Um, so here are like three or four examples of why I think your school should not be, no school should be named after him, and then I'm curious what your response is. Uh, he did say, you can't argue about it, that in, Lor in Lawrence versus Texas, he compared homosexual conduct to murder. He just did. People can go read it. If you deny it, I want people to go read it. And then, and that's bad, but that's, that's not the worst part of that story. The worst part of that story is a gay student at Princeton courageously stood up when Scalia gave a talk there and basically said, this really hurt me. This really offended me. How could you compare homosexual conduct to murder? Scalia could have said, I'm sorry I offended you. Um, I'm just making a legal argument here, taking it to its logical extreme. Um, but of course, I don't think homosexual conduct and murder are the same things. That's not what Scalia said to this poor student. Scalia doubled down and said, I don't apologize for what I say. That was just a, that he said that was a form of argument. But he did not go on to say anything like, of course, I don't think homosexual conduct and murder are the same. And I know you well enough to know you don't think homosexual conduct and murder are the same. So, okay. Um, the VMI case is unforgivable to me. Um, I don't care what kind, of, what kind of legal theory one ascribes to. A, you can read the 14th Amendment and know that an elite military school, taxpayer funded, that is a source of, of getting a high ranking position in the officer corps in the military can't be closed entirely to one gender. Just can't be. That's a, a law set that school up. That's a denial of the equal protection of the laws. And Scalia, the only dissenter in VMI, Thomas might have dissented. He recused himself, but I don't know the answer to that question. Um, in the oral, I'm almost done. In the oral argument in Fisher versus Texas, he absolutely said that he was not troubled by blacks not being at the University of Texas. Now, what he was doing there was vaguely referring to this mismatch theory, which you and I disagree about. But again, it's not necessarily that he would vote against affirmative action. So a lot of, that's not what I'm talking about. The way he said that was terrible. There was a way to say that that's not offensive. He picked, there are theories that have data that show blah, blah, blah. I mean, Thomas has tried to make that case much more, with much more data and statistics than Scalia did. Scalia just said, I don't really, if blacks aren't in Texas, I'm not troubled by that. Um, and then finally, in the Croson case, which I know you think came out correctly, I, I don't, doesn't matter. In Scalia's opinion in that case, the very end of it, he says, every time we affirm this kind of law, quote, another Croson burns, a uh, Croson or Defunis burns. Croson and Defunis were plaintiffs in affirmative action cases. I have no problem with disagreements about affirmative action. That image of white people burning because white people want more diversity in educational institutions is a bad image, especially given the history of our country and burning crosses and all of that. So I deduce from all of those things that this man was, in fact, a sexist, racist, and homophobe. So my question to you is, you, t you, you teach con law, if you're teaching Lawrence versus Texas, and a gay student says to you, or reads that and says, wait a minute, he's comparing, even if it's a legal argument, he's comparing my sex life to murder. How can he ask you that question, or she ask you that question, when your school is named after the guy who said it? Go. So there's a lot there. Let me unpack one part of it first yeah. and give my general perspective on the yeah. issue of when we should or should not change names of institutions 
based on bad things that people said, then I'll talk sort of more specifically about the particular points about Scalia. Is that okay? Sure. Uh, so first, you know, how do we discuss Scalia's opinions at Scalia Law School? Uh, much the same way as I did before uh, the name change, which happened six years ago. I go over many of his opinions in many classes. I'm sure you do in your classes. And, you know, neither I nor the students somehow shrink from criticism of him uh, when, you know, uh, critical points can be raised. Uh, I myself differ with Scalia on a number of constitutional issues, including some of those related to gay rights. Even when I don't differ with him, I think often there's a good case to be made against his position. And therefore, you know, we explored out with the students and the, the name of the school, I don't think plays that much role in it. For what it's worth, when I do surveys of my students, uh, I almost always there are more sort of liberal or democratic students than conservative or Republican ones. So uh, it's not as if criticism of Scalia is somehow verboten. And for what it's worth, I would say that Scalia himself would not want it to be verboten. Uh, he, you know, he had his faults, but he was always open to uh, debate and exchange with, uh, you know, uh, people with different views. Uh, now on the more general issue of naming, I'm not one of those people who says we should never rename anything because, you know, we have now decided the person had bad views. For example, I'm very open, I've, I've written about this too, renaming things that are named after Confederate leaders uh, because those are people whose main claim to fame is that they fought a horrible war in defense of slavery. Uh, and it was something they knew or should have known at the time was wrong. The idea that slavery is wrong is not something we just discovered <laughs> you know, in 2020 or whatever. Right. There was plenty of reason to understand that back in 1861. And a good many people, including a good many white Southerners, understood it even back then. So Robert E. Lee, Jefferson Davis, and others, uh, they deserve enormous blame and censure for what they did. And we should not honor them by naming things after them. On the other hand, I'm also not of the school of thought which says we should never name anything after anyone who, who did something bad or said something bad. For example, the university that I teach at is named after George Mason, who was a great man who helped inspire the Bill of Rights and had other great things. But George Mason was also a slave owner. And him being a slave owner, frankly, is way, way worse than anything that Scalia ever did or even anything that Scalia ever said. Your, your objections are mostly have actually about things okay, that I'm said. To, I'm just going to drop right that late, that one hole. But, but I did sure. say we have to gauge people by the sensibilities. Yeah, of I'm, I'm getting to that. So in George Mason's time, it was already possible to know that slavery was wrong. Yeah. Not only that, George Mason himself was one of those people who knew that it was wrong and said that it was wrong, and yet he continued to own slaves. Uh, so all of his life, and it's pretty obvious, he and many other founding fathers who kept on owning slaves, they were essentially making excuses pretty bad excuses, frankly, based on their self-interest. Thomas enough. Jefferson, James Madison, and others had the same issue. Right. So uh, I think we can certainly censure George Mason in a way maybe you can't say, censure Plato or Aristotle <laughs> in an era when almost everybody agreed uh, that slavery was right. right. Uh, uh, um, uh, so uh, nonetheless, I think the good that George Mason did is sufficient that you can honor him, even though we should keep in mind that he had this very horrible negative side. And I feel much the same way about Scalia with the big difference that the wrongs he did and said were much, much smaller, uh, frankly, than those that George Mason did in the context of his time. Uh, and now uh, sort of I'll take the particular issues perhaps in uh, reverse order with respect to Crozon and the other affirmative action cases. I do not think that if you read those statements in context, he meant that it would be a good thing if there were no black students at the University of Texas, or that he meant that uh, when a white person is disadvantaged by affirmative action, it's the same, it's as bad as if somebody's burned to death or lynch. Uh, in both of these cases, uh, he was either speaking swiftly and not super carefully, or making rhetorical exaggerations for effect. You can argue about whether this is the best way of speaking. Frankly, I think he would have done better to, speak, to say those things differently, but in context, it's pretty clear what he meant. And if you uh, uh, sort of refuse to name things after everyone who made comparable rhetorical exaggerations, pretty much every name of any prominent person would have to be swept away. Uh, so I think you, if you judge people by that standard, including those quotes as sort of reasons not to name things after them, uh, you know, that really would be, I hate to use the term, but that really would be a very excessive form of cancel culture. And many progressive heroes uh, would not stand that kind of scrutiny or even come close to it. Uh, on the VMI case, 
uh, this is an area where, you know, I used to think that he was right about the VMI yeah. case, but over the years, I decided he was wrong uh, for various reasons we can talk about. Uh, nonetheless, though, I think the arguments that he made in that dissent are plausible and reasonable parts of mainstream discourse as in the 1990s or even today that uh, there's a lot of, and you yourself have said things like this, actually, there's a lot of historical evidence that various forms of sex discrimination were considered not only in the 1860s, but even 100 years later, 120 years later, as normal parts of government policy, even today. Well, let me just, let me just interrupt for one second sure. there. Um, what I've said is there's no originalist basis for the 14th Amendment to be read as one barring gender gender okay. discrimination, so, but, there is a, but there is a clear textual basis for it. So, but let's just go on. I just want to make that, that clear. Yeah. So, so Scalia, as, as you know, um, uh, was, was an originalist, and therefore the main argument he was trying was to make... He was a textualist first. So, well, well, I'll get to the textualist point in a moment. Okay. Uh, on the originalist point, uh, you know, I think you and I agree that there's at least a plausible originalist yeah. argument for his position. Yeah. Indeed, you credit that argument more than I do, yes. as I know from our... <laughs> Some of previous ex yeah. experiences on the textualist argument, uh, the a text has words like equal protection and privileges or immunities and the like. But the relevant text in the 14th Amendment doesn't specifically bar sex discrimination. So uh, equal protection can't mean that no discrimination of any kind is permitted because all laws discriminate in some way, even a law against murder in a sense discriminates between murderers and, and, and others. Uh, and no, I'm not saying that murder is as bad as uh, being a woman or whatnot. I'm just saying, I'm just making an analogy yeah. and making the point that any uh, law classifies people in some way. So it's a matter of either historical analysis or other kinds of analysis which kinds of discrimination? No, no, let, no let, hold on, hold on. Let's stop at VMI. We're both. We, sure. I get. I, we're, you're saying a lot, and, and and I don't want to interrupt, but I have to on VMI. Sure. sure. Whatever one thinks of the equal protection clause, however one approaches it, and we, and we, I think you and I agree there have to be classifications. I mean, everyone agrees on that. Um, so, sure. so let's let's take the Justice Stevens approach. Forget Scalia for a second. You know, it's all one rat equal protection clause. The real question is: Is there a re reasonable reason for the government to make this classification? And Scalia would agree the rational basis test applies here. He would agree with that. Circa 1977 even, it's hard for me to imagine any rational reason for the government to exclude women from a taxpayer-funded elite university. Like, yeah. under what possible rational basis, not strict scrutiny or heightened scrutiny, under what possible reasonable effort to decide that, what, women shouldn't be in the army, women shouldn't be, no, none of that works anymore. I mean, it's all gone. Yeah. So I, I would say a couple of things on this. One is if you really think minimal rational basis applies in the way that the Supreme Court. No, that's the way the Supreme Court, where you would apply it, the way I would apply it. <laughs> so uh, um, if I thought that that kind of minimal rational basis applied, I would think that the VMI restriction could be upheld. The reason why I think it should not have been upheld was because I think some kind of higher than rational basis scrutiny uh -huh. should apply. But even today, we have... Uh, all female colleges and, and universities and in the private sector, to be sure. And they are exempted from Title IX uh, restrictions on sex discrimination. Uh, and uh, I think you could very easily construct a uh, rational basis justification for what VMI was doing, particularly back in 1996, when women still were not allowed to serve in combat in the armed forces. Uh, and when the... Yeah, we're going to have to disagree on that, but go on, move on. Um, and, 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 and a dominant conventional wisdom was that that should be upheld. Even today, although I've written in opposition to this, I think the court should strike it down. But even today, women are exempt from the uh, mandatory selective service registration. So if minimal rational basis is the, uh, you know, is the standard, then, uh, you know, then I, I think. Well, I wasn't saying minimal rational. I was just saying any interpretation of the Equal Protection Clause requires the government to come up with some kind of should require the government. To, I agree with you and and my friend Clark Nelly and other people at Cato that the current rational basis test is a fraud and we should get rid yeah. of it. I, you and I agree on this. I'm one of the few yeah, progressives yeah. who will say that, but I, I am saying that. But the, the question is, still is, Scalia's fine to live in a world where judges allow, not his policy, where judges allow an elite, incredibly important, institution to be all men, not private, but funded by the state. And yeah. you have not convinced me that's not a, a heinous thing. And it was seven to one. 
And God knows what Thomas would so, do. So I think it was a bad thing. Uh, and I think he voted the wrong way. But I also think that the argument he made okay, was enough. well within uh, sort of mainstream legal reasoning of the day. Uh, and therefore, uh, okay. while it certainly Fair can enough. be chalked up as a wrong opinion that he wrote, I don't think it's chalked up as, you know, this is in the realm of, uh, you know, Dred Scott and Plessy. Tell me about Ferguson the Princeton another... student. Not, not, not the case, but the okay, Princeton so, student. Uh, on the Princeton student, um, so I, I, I want to get, get now to the issue of gay rights. Yeah. I think this is an area, I don't know this for sure, but this is an area where it is likely that he was, in fact, a homophobe. Uh, I would also say that for, and this is not a defense of it because he should have known better, but for people in his generation and even people, frankly, a generation or two younger than that, homophobia was extremely common. Uh, and so if you want to judge it by your standards, a like relative at a time, the attitudes that he held on that were quite common in that time. And I think in all of these cases, while I disagree with him on some of them, like Lawrence v. Texas and Obergefell, in all of these cases, there were certainly very plausible legal arguments uh, for his position. On the analogy to murder, uh, I do not think either in the opinion or in his response to Princeton student, he was saying uh, that uh, gay sex is on the same moral plane as murder. Rather, what he was saying is that in his opinion in Lawrence v. Texas, he was responding to what frankly I think was one of the weaker arguments of the majority, where they said, well, mere moral disapprobation is not enough to make something illegal. And Scalia says, well, look at all the stuff that we make illegal in large part, uh, or so in some cases exclusively because we morally disapprove of, and murder was on that list. You know, one big reason why we make murder illegal is because we think it's uh, we, we morally disapprove no, of it. That's not the main uh, reason. I think, that, that isn't the main reason. Yeah. So I think that analogy is not even one of the better ones in his long string of other analogies. Right. But that's what he was saying. He was not saying uh, that uh, murder and homosexual sex are on the same plane. He was just saying these are both things that some governments ban in considerable part because the people can think that this is immoral. Uh, and, you know, I think it's not a good analogy. There are other things in his list which are better analogies, like the ban on uh, you know, like bans on, uh, uh, you know, the consumption of pornography and sure. other things like that. Sure. Um, uh, uh, but again, if you never name almost any justice who's been on the Supreme Court as long as Scalia, you can find really bad analogies and arguments that they've made in some of their opinions. Well, uh, as for the response to Princeton student, once again, I think Scalia couldn't should have been more sensitive and tactful in what he said there. Uh, again, if sensitivity and tactfulness in all such situations is a requirement for naming institutions after people, you will find yourself uh, disallowing a great many names of a great many people, including uh, many progressives. And by saying this, I do not mean to say what well, that means what Scalia said was wonderful and fine. All I'm saying is that you place it in its proper context and it should play a relatively modest part in our evaluation okay. of his overall legacy. Uh, and my general take in, on his view on gay rights is that he was wrong about his general moral evaluation of, 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 of gays and lesbians and their uh, relationships. And he was wrong in at least many of the legal issues, including in Lawrence and in Obergefell. As you know, I uh, co-authored an amicus brief in Obergefell urging the Supreme Court to strike down laws banning same-sex marriage based on a different rationale from the one that right. uh, Justice Kennedy right. ultimately used. So I don't have any great love or sympathy for Scalia's position on this issue, but uh, I don't see it as fundamentally different than, for example, uh, naming Brandeis University after Louis Brandeis, even though Brandeis in the famous Brandeis briefs, those briefs are all about sexism in that they yeah, justify various so sexist grounds. But, but 1920. Um, discriminatory rules for women. Uh, and Brandeis said a good many other things, which uh, are very problematic uh, from a modern liberal point of view, by which I mean liberal at writ large, not just liberal okay. in the sense so, of left so, wing. So let me jump and in there here are many say, other examples like that. Let me jump in and say, first of all, um, you've always, as long as I've known you anyway, you're, um, you're clearly um, pers devoted to gay rights. So I, don't want, I don't want anyone to interpret mm -hmm. any of these questions to suggest otherwise. Um, I, I guess the only thing, and then we'll move on to something more substantive. Thank you for engaging me on this. And, and your answers are, are good ones. And I knew they would be because you're a smart guy and a thoughtful guy. Um, I will say I don't think I could make this case about Rehnquist, who voted the same way as Scalia in almost every case we're talking about. I don't think I could make this case about O'Connor, who voted mostly with, not in all of these cases, but in a lot of cases with Scalia. Um, I don't think I can make this case about a lot of people. Um, I think it's a combination to me, Ilya, 
Um, he, he, I, I, so Justice O'Connor came to my law school twice and was asked some pretty hard questions and answered all of them with dignity, sense of, I, I, I despise her jurisprudence, you know that. I, but, but she answered them with dignity and with class and sensitivity to where she was, you know, and who she was dealing with. Um, most Supreme Court justices in my, I think John, Justice Thomas is, who is my least liked justice of all time, um, is an incredibly nice person in person and, and is warm and fuzzy and all that. I'm not suggesting you have to be that, but Scalia had a pattern of behavior. He had a big incident at UVA where he got really mad because a student was late picking him up at the airport because there was a snowstorm or something and the student couldn't get there. There is a long history. And when you said he engages with people who disagree with him, no, not really. I've been with, I've, I, he and I had a man oh man oh once in front of 500 people. He really did refuse to engage. He, he will say his sentence and then stop and move on. And there's nothing more you can do because he's a Supreme Court justice. There's, my only response to you is every point you make is valid, I think, because most of the points you make are valid, whether I agree with them or not. But when you add it all up, it just might be the sum shows a pattern of behavior that we shouldn't honor. I know you disagree with that, but this is a pattern thing. It's not each one individually. Of course, we're, I, two or three of these, I could give you 10 more. I'm not going to bore the audience with that. Sure. So that's all, and you can have the last word on that. You can have the last word on so, that. So let me just briefly say yeah. two things on that. One is, uh, or maybe three, one is okay. he did engage a lot with people who disagree with him. This friendship with Ruth Bader Ginsburg is the most Now, they didn't talk example, about con law. That's not true. They did not talk about well, con law. But, but there's many other examples. It is also true, I think, that you know there are certainly incidents where he was obnoxious uh, in ways that he shouldn't have been. I think that in the greater scheme of things, and we're talking about a Supreme Court justice, this matters much less than the person's contribution to jurisprudence and legal thought, which in Scalia's case was very significant. Uh, and uh, that's why I will just come back to the point I made at the beginning. When you assess these historical figures, you have to weight the good against the bad. And there's certainly some stuff on the bad with Scalia, some related to his attitudes, some related to his personality, some perhaps related to some legal issues that he just got wrong in ways that he shouldn't have. But there is a large uh, amount in the sum total of good. He made major contribution to jurisprudence in several areas. I think he improved the Supreme Court's pre-existing precedent and also its practices, particularly when it comes to methodology of both con law and statutory interpretation. And therefore, you, I think you can make a case for naming a school after him that's at least as good as the case for naming a school after Brandeis or Cardozo, uh, or in an earlier era, John Marshall, all historical figures that had significant flaws, including ones that could be understood in their day, like Marshall's attitude towards slavery, for example, sure. uh, which were much worse than any attitudes that Scalia had. Uh, but you can make an argument that's sort of, uh, that's a good argument that sort of the good that these people did was sufficiently great to justify honoring them. If you want to have a tougher standard than that, we don't honor anybody who had a flawed personality or who did that's anything. That's not what I'm saying. No, no, that's not, that, I'm not saying that, the, that you're saying that. I don't think that's your view, yeah. but there are some people who at least implicitly hold that position. If you want to do that, then it should be across applied across the board. So we would rename Brandeis University. We would rename the Woodrow Wilson Center at Princeton. Right. We would rename Cardozo Wasco and John Marshall Wasco and so on. Okay, fair enough. Thank you, for, thank you for engaging on that. And we only have like 10 minutes left. So let me... Segue, but it's a good segue. Um, when you say Scalia made all these great contributions that have to be weighed against, well, you, well you've admitted, as you, as you always, because you're always honest, things you wouldn't approve of. You wouldn't approve of the way he handled the Princeton situation. I know you. You wouldn't. It, it, was, it was very sure. disrespectful. So, uh, and I know you wouldn't. You're never like that. So, I, you know. Um, all right. So his biggest contribution, other than maybe the legislative history and statutory interpretation, let's, not, let's just put that to the side. Obviously, he brought originalism to the, you know, he, he, he's most associated um, with bringing originalism to the Supreme Court and the public and our political system. You'd agree with that. That's what people most associate him with. Yeah, I, I think that's right. Yes. Okay. Um, despite the fact that Randy Barnett wrote um, well into Scalia's career, that Scalia, Scalia was not an originalist. Yes. Despite the fact that I've shown in three law review articles and two books that... Um, He's not an originalist. Lawrence 
uh, Rosenthal, I'm, I may have that name wrong, I'm sorry, Professor Chapman has written an article saying in Fourth, in fourth Amendment cases, which is where people always say, see, Scalia didn't vote his, his priors, uh, he was an originalist 18% of the time, 18% of the time. I'm not a crim pro person, so I can't defend that. I'm just, I'm just telling you what Rosenthal said in a law review article. Um, and Judd Campbell has shown, without any doubt, that everything we know about the First Amendment is, is non-originalist. It's not, it may be great policy. It may be good stuff. It may be that precedent takes precedence over originalism, which is fair. I don't blame originalists for that at all. Wherever precedent comes is hard. But it's still true that there is no originalist basis for anything other than an anti-prior restraint doctrine or maybe a little bit more. I don't want to argue that point. What I, what I do want to suggest to you, though, is what Scalia is most famous for doing is a ruse. The Supreme Court is not an originalist inter, inter, institution. Not today, not yesterday, not 50 years ago. Um, all of First Amendment law is anti-originalist. Frankly, most of federalism is anti-originalist in, 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 in a sense that we know that there's supposed to be clear error judicial review. That's not what we have. That's what Hamilton said to Brutus. They won't strike down laws unless it's irreconcilable variance um, against the manifest tenor, which meant the same thing. My point here is, um, one, are you an originalist? And two, do you really think Scalia's body of law is originalist? Because I got to tell you, there's a bunch of us who have shown that it wasn't. So go ahead. So I would say two things. Yes, I am an originalist, okay. albeit I'm not as strongly committed to it as some people are. In my work, I distinguish between people who are intrinsicist originalists and who say, therefore, it has inherent value, it's a good in and of itself, versus people who are instrumental originalists, by which I mean people who think that all things considered, an originalist approach to constitutional interpretation, at least at this point in our history, is likely to have better results than other plausible alternatives. And I'm an instrumental originalist. I'm not the only one. Uh, John McGinnis and Michael Rappaport, another example, Akil Amar, I think falls into this category and some others as well. Uh, but yes, with that caveat, I'm an originalist. On Scalia, obviously, I differ with you on some of the particular issues that you mentioned, especially with regards to federalism and so-called clear error judicial review, probably the First Amendment as well, though I don't know as much about that. On the Fourth Amendment, I think I just lack the expertise to assess it. I do think Scalia sincerely tried to be originalist. Obviously, in some areas, he may have been stymied in that either because of the weight of precedent, which is something to originally with disagree among themselves about sure. how to deal with precedent. And that's just fair. Like with the, that's the, the precedent thing is fair. Right. An another reason is that over the last 30 to 40 years, uh, there's been a lot of areas where just not a lot of work was done on the original meaning of various provisions. And that scholarship began to pick up ground over Scalia's career. I don't think he was always on top of the later scholarship in every area. Few Supreme Court justices are. Uh, and then finally, of course, there's the issue of building up to five votes on the court. While Scalia arguably made fewer compromises than some other Supreme Court justices, <laughs> he did make some. Uh, um, I don't think he was completely above doing that. And so he, some of what you see is the result of that. Uh, so I think it's entirely fair to say that there are probably places where Scalia failed to live up to his own principles. Uh, and uh you know, uh, and you know, Randy Barnett said just that, and so have some other people. I knew Randy was at least partly right about that. I don't think it's fair to say that the man was just completely a charlatan and a fraud, or that it was a ruse or whatever. Uh, I think you know he did make a sincere effort in a number of places. He did move the jurisprudence in that direction. There are probably other places where either he didn't try as hard as he should have, or you know he just you know, got the original meaning wrong, just as some living constitutionalists can get wrong the implications of their methodology sure, sure. Uh, for a particular case, All right. which, which happens sometimes. It's a reasonable answer. Last question, um, and you and I have discussed this many times, um, but I really want it for the audience. Um, so when Obergefell and Windsor and the same-sex marriage cases were percolating and coming up, um, you and, and Calabresi agrees with this 100%, I think, right? You and Calab uh, the, the co found you, you belong to the Federal Society. And Steve Calabresi, law professor at Northwestern, was a co-founder of the Federal Society. Yeah. And both of you separately, maybe together, uh, you ever, ever do it together? I know separately you came to the we, same we, we did not do anything together because we have somewhat different arguments okay. that we made. Well, you, well, well, but you both made the argument that the 14th Amendment was meant to bar caste-type legislation. Um, 
actually made a slightly different argument, but go ahead. Well, tell me your argument. Okay, well, no, I don't want to put words in your mouth. So why did you think state bans on same-sex marriage were unconstitutional? So in my view, uh, the original meaning of the 14th Amendment, particularly the privileged immunities and equal protection, uh, they bar classifications uh, that are irrational and oppressive, by which I mean irrational in a sort of a stronger sense than merely the minimum rational basis that we talked about earlier sure. with respect to BMI. Sure. And even back then in 1868, it was understood by many people and by most that, at least in principle, some forms of sex discrimination could fall in that category. At the time, because of people's factual understanding of differences between the sexes, it was thought that most uh, sex-based classification, at least most of those existing back then, would pass that scrutiny because most people believed that, that there were very fundamental differences between men and women that made women unfit to hold what we're, we're, we're seeing to be male roles and also men in many cases unfit to hold and, traditional And women were property of their husbands in many states. Um, that had actually been changing greatly by- But it was still uh, there. With, with, it's, it's still there in some states, not uh, there in, in many others. Uh, mar So-called married women's property laws uh, had begun in the 1840s and 50s and it progressed a lot. But my point, you know, setting that issue aside, my point is that uh, it was widely believed at that time that sort of the inherent nature of women precluded them from being yeah. in various male roles. Uh, and also, therefore, that a same sex relationship could not have could not serve the kinds of functions that an, an opposite sex relationship could. Uh, we now know and certainly knew by the time of Obergefell and indeed well right. before that this factual understanding was wrong. And therefore, that many gender classifications that in 1870 or even in 1950 or 1960 could perhaps be seen as passing scrutiny based on what was known at the time uh, that they could not pass scrutiny. Calabresi's argument is related uh, to- Hold on, that's okay. Forget different. Calabresi. Um, so the argument you, you just gave, okay, which I, which by the way, I, I have no issue <laughs> with that argument, but the argument that you just gave, we know for a historical fact that the original public expectation, I understand what you're going to say, but hold on. The expectation of the people who ratified the 14th Amendment was not gender equality. That's just true. Uh, uh, Chris Green and I keep fighting about this, and he points to minority views. Yes, there was a minority view on that. But original public meaning is not the minority view. The original public meaning has to mean the dominant, or at least at least the plurality view. Otherwise, original public meaning has no meaning. So the plurality view in 1868 was women did not get this kind of protection. That You have to concede that, right? At least the plurality view. So when we're looking at the original public meaning, I know you probably have anticipated this answer, but I want to make it for the audience. When we talk about the original public meaning, it's important to distinguish between two things. One is the original understanding of the rules, yep. and the other is the original understanding of facts. Any legal case, whether constitutional or not, requires applying a rule to the facts. Uh, and you and I can agree on what the rule is, but yet have very different understandings of whether sure. it really was the case the colonel mustard uh, yes. killed the, yes. uh, the victim of the crime or not. Uh, and if I think the evidence shows he did kill him and you think it doesn't, then we're going to disagree on whether a guy was guilty, even though we have exactly the same interpretation of law against murder. Okay. Similarly, my point is that in 1868, most people, except for the minority of uh, feminist that we were that yeah. you and Chris Green were talking about. Yeah. Most people thought that the facts were such that the abilities of women were so fundamentally different from those of men that it made perfect sense to exclude women from a variety of roles for which men were included. Uh, and uh, that fact has changed, uh, or not the fact that it changed, but our knowledge of the fact has changed. Just like in the 1870s, many people would have said that phrenological evidence should be accepted in trials, phrenological evidence is evidence about somebody's personality that supposedly can be gleaned from the shape of their skull. Right. In the 1860s and 70s, many respected scientists and intellectuals thought this was a real science. We now know that it's a hoax, so that today a conviction resting on phrenological evidence would fail constitutional standards of due process, whereas such a ruling back in 1870 might reasonably have been thought, you know, it didn't fail them because people believed at the time that 
phrenology is real. Do you agree? Uh, so the do you understanding agree? of sex that people had in 1868 I got it, I got it. is on the same plane as phrenology. Do you agree with Larry Solomons, who, who for the, those non-law professors listening, is considered by many to be kind of the most influential new originalist around? Um, do you agree with Larry Solomons' statement that he made in his Northwestern piece just last year, I think? And actually, he talked about my scholarship when he said this, um, is... Um, even if we know what the original intended application would have been to the people living at the time, if, quote, views about facts change, not just facts change, if views about facts change, then judges are not bound by those initial expected applications. I partly agree with him. Okay. Uh, I think... To the, and it may be that if Larry and I had a chance to talk about this, we would fully agree. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think when you're talking about original expected applications, which for those who don't know are simply the, speci- the expectations that people at the time yeah. had about the outcomes of particular cases, yeah. in some cases, those applications are just based on an understanding of the meaning of the rule itself. But in other cases, they may be based on the meaning of the rule combined with the understanding of the facts. So if what has changed is a change in the facts uh, rather than a change in the uh, linguistic understanding of the rule, then the change in the understanding of the facts is uh, could lead to change. Though in my view, ideally at least, it should be actual changes in the actual facts yeah. rather than change in understanding. But in a world where our knowledge is imperfect, uh, realistically, the best that judges can do, or best anybody can do, is get the best understanding of the facts that we can get given our limitations at the time. And we know that sometimes we're going to be wrong about things, just like people in 1868 were wrong about many of the facts sure. related to women. We today are probably wrong about some facts too. So my very so you you just set the record, I think, for the longest Supreme Minister podcast. Which is not no surprise because I really you know, um, my so I hope the audience will still be with us. You know, it's, it's 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 a lot to ask them to stay on for more than an hour. But my very last question is actually then other than about other than the questions about your book, which I think are really important, and I hope people read your book. Um, this is my this is my last question, and it's my most important. In a world with a constitution, where most of the litigated provisions ha- contain imprecise language abridging speech, establishment, free exercise, unreasonable searches and seizures, due process, equal protection, and so on. In a world where the most importantly litigated provisions are very imprecise and were written long ago, either 1868 for most of them or as applied to the states or 1788 as applied to the federal government, whichever. Ilya, isn't it true that vague and imprecise rules by definition will cause changed applications as societies and people change, evolve, grow, technology, and so on. And then the question becomes, I'm not a living constitutionalist, but for living constitutionalists, uh, Chemerinsky and Dorf and Tribe and those people, they would say to you, we're not making up rules. We're not make that's what they're accused of. It's a straw man. We don't protect we don't we don't we don't make up rules. We take the very vague, imprecise rules of freedom of speech and exercise and all that, and we apply them to changing facts. And we have to take into account the modern world to figure out how to apply a general principle of freedom of religion a general principle of freedom of speech, a general principle of equality and due process to ever-changing cultures, technologies, migration, hopefully, in your case, you know, all these things. What's the difference between your originalism and Mike Dorff's living constitutionalism if you both agree that we're dealing with vague principles applied over time to changing conditions and we're not bound by the original applications? So... I think there is some overlap between our views, but there are important differences too. You have about two the minutes overlap, to, I don't want to interrupt think, you. Go, go for two minutes, then we've got to call it off. Go. Sure. So the overlap is that I think Mike Dorf and I and you and most reasonable people would agree that you have to apply rules to changing facts and conditions and the like, and those changing conditions might lead to seemingly different outcomes. Uh, where we differ is I think there's a large parts of all the provisions you named where even if the boundaries are fuzzy, there's cores which are not. And it makes a difference whether you interpret that core 
from an originalist point of view or something else, or at least in many cases, it will make a difference. Uh, what's litigated will always be what's sort of at the boundaries or at the fuzzy edge of whatever the currently dominant legal theory is. Uh, but what's often important about the system is not what gets litigated, but what doesn't. And what doesn't often will be determinate and clear, even if the rule has some fuzzy boundaries. Uh, and uh, I think there is still a difference between a theory which says the rule itself doesn't change even if it has to t apply to new facts or new circumstances, and one that says the rule itself can change uh, in at least some uh, situations. Uh, so therefore, uh, there can be convergence between originalism and living constitutionalism on some issues. That's particularly depending on the different forms that the two theories might take. Uh, but there will also be a significant core of difference uh, as well. Thank you so much, Ilya. This has been so much fun. I could talk to you for two more hours, but I don't think the audience would tolerate it. So th sure. thank you so much. Thank you.